kingdom fungi, one of the things that they all are, are they're going to be heterotrophic as we have studied in class. There's a whole bunch of these different fungi here, from these toadstools, quite poisonous, to those which are growing on trees, sac fungi, fungi that you might find growing on bread mold, and of course those of you who might like to bake uh, things like bread, yeast. And one of the things that we know is that they are all heterotrophic, but most of the work of fungi is below ground. The reason I brought the yeast up in here is that's one of the few single-celled fungi. All the others are multicellular. So we'll see in terms of, we're going to emphasize the multicellular fungi. We're going to look at the class, class I mean the phylums in which they are categorized. And in class we're going to check out some mold and some of the basidiomycota or the cat fungi which you started to dissect the other day in class. Okay, in terms of common ancestry, we as the animals are quite closely related to fungi. When I was doing some research, I came across this, it's a variation of the phylogenetic tree. It's called a cladogram or a clad. And what we have is this CSI, and it does not stand for crime scene investigation. Rather, these special genetic markers which enable scientists and biochemists to literally begin to classify using DNA, RNA, and proteins how closely related organisms are. And what we can notice back here is way back here, whereas the division between where plants went one way and animals and fungi went the other way in terms of their evolutionary relationships. And then more recently we could see here there are more genetic markers that are more related to fungi and animals than there are in fungi and plants and fungi and I mean in animals and plants. So this kind of gives you a very good diagram in terms of the scale of evolution. We want to keep in mind that we're still looking at these evolutionary links and how organisms are classified and how they are put into different categories. The four phyla of fungi. We have the water molds here not to confuse with slime molds, okay, or the other things which are more protus-like. And then we have here the bread molds. These are the ones that are going to be very, uh, pretty much here on the microscopic scale. You might be able to see them with the naked eye if there's a bunch of them clustered together, especially they're distinguishing white filaments, the hyphae, which are going to be the finger-like or very thread-like protrusions that literally are digesting the substance which is growing on. And then we see here more of the macroscopic here with respect to the fungi. And you'll notice that here within the kingdom fungi there is a, a typical common ancestor and there, each area here is where the branching also occurs. General characteristics, some of the things that we've gone over in class they're all strict heterotrophs, meaning that they often get their carbon source. It could be from a derivative of sugar, and they require oxygen in order to oxidize this sugar or the organic matter. And that is essentially going to be a waste product of carbon dioxide and water, but they do that in order to get the ATP. The ATP is going to be that energy molecule which allows them to grow. And here we see these white filaments right in here. I can even join them. And the white filaments are the hyphae, which are kind of tendrils continually digesting externally. They're getting the nutrients here in order to provide each of their cells with the ATP. We can also see how they, the filaments are even way here in terms of the fungus of athlete's foot. This is where we can see a parasitic relationship that the fungi have with us in terms of animals. And literally the skin of this person is being digested as these thread-like structures are being spread out throughout this wound here. And so subsequently, it's very painful as you can see, and you might be able to get an antifungal treatment which will hopefully destroy the cells which are reproducing. But this is a classic example of a parasitic relationship. Later on I'll show you a mutualistic relationship with the roots of 
trees. And also remember the Science Friday video that we saw with respect to the um, relationship there. Okay, the other thing is that, as I mentioned in class, there's an evolutionary relationship with respect to chitin. Chitin, remember, is that exoskeleton that many the insects have and the arthropods have. It's that polymer of glucose. It also is one indication of the relationship of animals to fungi because it is going to be in the cell walls of all the fungi. Another thing that the fungi have with animals in terms of the relationship is how we're going to store energy, our excess glucose. Plants recall, plants are going to store the excess glucose as starches. Animals and fungi are going to restore the excess glucose as glycogen. Even though that they are non-motile, they're going to quote unquote move towards their organisms with the when they have the hyphae. So the hyphae are not necessarily moving but growing. So one cell, then it divides into two. These cells can then elongate. And so each of these cells can asexually divide into two, and they in turn can elongate. And this is how the fungi can actually begin to move or at least increase its surface area as well as its food source. So these are the hyphae which are growing, most likely underground. Okay, so it's a pretty good uh, sample in terms of the hyphae. You got here the cap of the mushroom. The stalk of the mushrooms, you might see sometimes it's called state, but mainly here's the underground network of hyphae. And what's going to happen is that each of these fruiting bodies are going to be smaller reproductive structures of the mushroom, which has popped up overnight, literally. If you can do a time lapse of some of these mushrooms in light of the backyard, if you kick the mushroom, you are helping it to spread its spores, and if these spores germinate, each spore can literally germinate into more hyphae and mycelia and not just produce one but thousands of these different types of mushrooms. So in terms of the mushrooms its sexual reproduction, underneath the cap are where we're going to find the spores. There are going to be these spores that can be produced by meiosis and these spores which can be produced by meiosis can have genetic variation. We're going to continue to see that theme of genetic variation as we look through this whole process of evolution and realizing that the genetic variation, remember, can add either positive traits to a species or in some cases it can add negative traits or in some cases it could just be simply neutral. The genetic variation may not have any effect in terms of the relationship the organism has with the environment. But what we can see here is that the spores are going to be released often when it's the weather's going to be dry. So they're going to, the spores can fall onto the dry ground and they can begin to lay dormant. And once water is available, and that's the key, you're going to find the idea of mushrooms popping up overnight when moisture is available because that is a requirement for them to reproduce. The spores can then start to germinate. And, the, and then in the germination, when they start to cluster, they're going to form a network called mycelium. Ultimately, each of these can then poof, grow up and to be a whole brand new mushroom. You go in the backyard, you kick it, and you spread more and more of the mushroom. But remember, to keep in mind, the hyphae are down here, and they can also form the mycelium within the stalk itself. So there's a bunch of different terminologies that can be interchanged with this group of organisms. The other type of fungus that we're going to look at would be the black bread mold. These are on the microscopic level. So what we have are these, they look really under, under the microscope, they're going to look like little lollipops with these little dots inside. The dots inside are the spores, so they too reproduce by spores. It's very possible that when two spores unite, we can see the concept in terms of their sexual reproduction. Thus, it's going to form what we call a zygospore. This is going to undergo meiosis again, more genetic variation. Each of these spores can reproduce more. So you can see in here what's going on is that the hyphae are beginning to digest the bread. We can consider it to be extracellular or outside the cell digestion and then internal absorption. So once the chemicals of the bread are digested extracellularly by these enzymes, then the 
rhizopustulonophore or the black bread mold can eventually absorb these nutrients. Here's an example of a mutualistic relationship that some fungi have. Here's a my, microcar, excuse me, mycorrhizal fungi. And this is going to help to increase the surface area of the roots. It will also enable plants to obtain and absorb more H2O. And in return, the plant is going to return its glucose. So it's mutualistic in that, whoops, let me write glucose, that both the fungi and the plant benefit. Thus, it's a plus-plus relationship. The glucose uh, that is made by the plant, the fungi get. The extra surface area and absorption of water, the plant receives. Thus, a win-win situation in this case here. Then we have another one in terms of lichens. Lichens, it's with fungi and either either a cyanobacteria, an algae, or a well, that's usually the, the other two. Usually the algae or a cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria. Both of those, both of these organisms can photosynthesize. So similar, these photosynthetic organisms provide the fungus with the glucose it needs to obtain energy, and in the meantime, the fungi is going to allow surface area and water for these lichens to grow, often on rock. And so one of the things that we're going to look at later on is that these are also going to be really important in terms of the ecosystem as this rock is going to be broken up by the fungi as the hyphae continue to go internally and break down to rock into smaller smaller pieces ultimately helping to form the nutrients of the soil itself. So we see a lot of things in fungi besides being decomposers. Okay, so where they're decomposers, that's one of their main job. They can be parasitic and they can also have mutualistic relationships. Okay, so that's one of the various, various um, characteristics of fungi. They're all heterotrophic, they're microscopic, they're macroscopic, they're a huge range, but there are some things that do bind them.